Uh, well, hello everyone. Uh, thank you so much for being here uh, to our participants. Um, today we're having the uh, next geothermal meeting uh, for Iceland alone. And we're having Jackson Grimes and Matt Vilante. So uh, we're going to start with uh, Jackson's uh, presentation about geothermal energy in Iceland. And let me introduce you uh, to Jackson Grimes. Uh, he's a master's student with the Iceland School of Energy at Reykjavik University, obtaining a degree in sustainable energy science. Um, his research focuses on the social dimension of renewable energy enterprises and how community ideologies can be better integrated into the design and planning of renewable infrastructure. He previously graduated from Texas State University with a degree in geography and environmental resource management. Okay, uh, thank you so much for being here today, Jackson. And now it's your time. Thanks for having me, Fernando, and all of the Geotheorem group. And I have quite a bit of information to go through today, so I'm just gonna dive in here. All right. um, great. So first off to talk about plate boundaries. I'm sure everyone's fairly familiar with these. Um, what makes Iceland unique is its location on a mid-ocean ridge, which here is displayed in purple, the purple lines, and those are known as divergent plate boundaries. So when the plates are moving apart from each other. Um, these are zones often of submarine volcanism. Um, and as you can imagine, harnessing heat from the bottom of the ocean is not always the easiest of possibilities. So um, Iceland is unique in that it is a mid-ocean ridge that occurs above sea level, which we'll talk about the geology of that shortly. Uh, the red zones in this map are divergent plate boundaries. Um, oh, excuse me. Uh, convergent plate boundaries and they are the ring of fire where traditionally you see uh, many volcanoes and sites of geothermal development. So to go back to how the mid-ocean ridge forms and this is the classic view where these the mid-ocean ridge are isolated volcanic islands. Um, they're not necessarily near, um, oh, excuse me, the oceanic islands are not necessarily near uh, a mid-ocean ridge. Um, a classic example of this is Hawaii. And in these situations, um, magma rises from the asthenosphere up to, this, up to the crust where it pushes old crust aside and then eventually forms the island. Uh, the second is where the magma uh, comes from the mantle plume or, or a hot spot, and the hot rock rises from deep within the mantle to form a volcano. Iceland is unique in that it is a mantle plume situated under a mid ocean ridge. So that means that it provides extra heat and it contributes to the fact that Iceland is above sea level. So to take a step back and look at it on the larger scale situation, um, the, here is Iceland as it is located on the mid-ocean ridge. And from this graph, you can see the red dots are where the mantle uh, plume has moved throughout millions of years. Um, the green in this is the continental land masses where the black is the above sea level basalt that is formed and the gray is the below water that has been formed in these processes. And as it's just going through time here. Okay. And then these volcanically active areas are associated with active rift zones um, or seismically active areas, um, which these fissures, as you can see in the top left, um, these are formed by faulting within the seismically active areas. Uh, on this map, all these red dots are the earthquakes that occur in Iceland. So these are the zones of the highest potential geothermal resource. Of course, not all of the, and this is just 
the different zones as they're labeled within the Icelandic geology. But of course, not all geothermal development in Iceland occurs within the high temperature areas. Um, this map is all of the boreholes that have been dug in Iceland. So these are all the zones where some sort of geothermal production occurs. Um, outside of the dark gray area, most of the boreholes are used to produce heat for district heating purposes or space heating purposes, um, which is why Iceland is habitable, even for areas that are very cold throughout the year. Uh, moving on to show some pictures of what Iceland really looks like. Um, lots of lava flows, basaltic rock dominates, which is a very high, has a high permeability and means that it is relatively easy for the heat to be captured and utilized. So to get into how a geothermal system works, you have three main components. That is your atmosphere, your fractured rock, oops, and your magma. So we can also call it in the atmosphere, it either manifests as water or in the case of Iceland as snow. Fractured rock is also known as permeable rock. And then the magma, of course, is your heat source. This is a conceptual model. Um, obviously, in the real world, not everything's going to be quite as perfect here. But so for the purpose of this presentation, we're considering this as a conceptual model with a high temperature liquid dominant reservoir. And as water infiltrates into the fractured rock, it gains heat. When it gains heat, it becomes more buoyant. And as that occurs, it will rise back to the surface of the, the crust and will manifest uh, well, surface manifestations, geysers, mud pots, hot pools, what have you. And that is a telltale sign of geothermal resource. So the deep magma chamber usually six to eight kilometers below ground. Um, there's a brittle ductile boundary, which we'll go into a little later. This is just showing all of the components of a geothermal system. So the brittle conductile boundary, which as I said, below, occurs six to eight kilometers below the ground, is where the fractured rock meets the melted rock, where the heat transfer begins to change. So in the conductive layer, which is below the, is, is the ductile boundary, heat is transferred through rocks. And above this boundary is the invective heat transfer, where the heat is carried through water. Another way that we look at geothermal systems is isotherms. Isotherms are surfaces of equal temperature. And this is a concept that was developed to help us better understand how geothermal systems may operate and how fluids flow through the system. Another way that you can gauge what the temperature in a geothermal system will be is by boiling point depth. So as temperature increases, you're going deeper into the earth um, and pressure is the same. So it, the boiling point is dependent on the pressure and is proportional to depth. One thing to note in this graph is how the nature of the geothermal system will affect the boiling point, boiling point depth um, with increasing salinity or increasing dissolved solids. The, Temperature will have to be hotter before, um, or the, the pressure will be hotter before boiling occurs. And then in more gas dominated reservoirs, it, it, it is lesser. There are several ways to model geothermal systems. The three most, or the, the three we use are reservoir models, which, as you can see from this image, is a wider view of the system. The geological conceptual model contains uh, 
um, all sorts of data about the upflow and general, or sorry, not the upflow, but the general rock structure that you'll see in these systems. Uh, and then the specialized upflow model is only concerned about how water flows through the system. So within the reservoir model, you have side boundaries, a bottom boundary, and a top boundary, where you'll be able to see what is happening within the system. So defining the top boundary, um, you need to measure from the heat point source, which is the magma, um, the heat from diffused sources, which are the warm and steaming ground. And then you will take away the background crustal heat and mass flow is more difficult to measure due to the mixing and boiling of the water. And usually uh, you can use the chemical balance of the water that you can test to find out uh, more about it. This is the process as you can see where the water comes in through the fractured rock or into the top boundary. And then as it comes back out of the point source. So point source measurements occur where you can take them where surface manifestation, manifestations occur. Natural geothermal heat discharges occur through the soil, uh, from water surfaces, turmoils, springs, geysers, and seepage into lakes or rivers. Uh, of course, all of these require measurements, and sometimes it's difficult to actually get to these sites. So what is another means other than uh, humans? We can also use drones and infrared. Um, here's just a nice shot of how those come up and how you can tell the heat of a, of a system without having to ever really walk the, the geography. More efficient than, than in, in person as well. And good for monitoring changes over time because you can have a snapshot of how things work. So talk about permeability because this is very important with the uh, understanding the system and understanding how much heat you'll be able to get out of a geothermal reservoir. So the hot water flows, of course, easily through high permeability rocks. Um, and therefore, it is a correlation between the isotherms and the permeability of the structure. The hot water flows horizontally underneath the per low permeability rock and the isotherms begin to spread out and create this mushroom shape. And that will give you the first estimate of how permeable the structure is. Um, the second part of a geothermal system is the chemical composition of it. So whether, where the water comes from will have to do with that. And I mean, Iceland, a lot of the systems are, are seawater. There also the fluid mineral interaction is crucial to, and we'll talk about that in just a second here, and the boiling and mixing of the waters in the, in the rock. So the chemistry is affected by many factors. There's lots of reactions between the geothermal fluid and the minerals in the rocks, and these will change the composition of the fluids. The three most important chemical constituents of a geothermal system and how they relate to reservoir structure. So the first is the chloride, the yellow zone in this image, which is where as the, you, this is where you want to drill into. So you want to reach this pocket in the ground because that's where the, the heat, the highest heat is. Um, it is the hottest part of the system and it's characterized by a number of total dissolved solids and contains high levels of silica. At the margins of the reservoir, waters are cooler than in the central zone, and this means they will absorb more CO2. If these waters reach the surface, they form carbonate. The near surface zone in the orange is dominated by sulfate which can turn into sulfic acid if it becomes oxidized and will alter the rock structure into clay to form mud pools. These are often associated with geothermal areas around the world. 
So when you see a mud pool, it is safe to assume that there is a high temperature geothermal system. And within the central yellow zone, the chloride, the, it's a neutral pH. And as I stated, that's your production target. Um, this can manifest as the surface as geysers and boiling springs. Within the um, outside region, the dissolved CO2 is cooler, where it becomes bicarbonate, and the hydrogen sulfide at boiling zones with a low pH. So as we were talking about the silica, it is a part of the geothermal system and it is common, one of the most common elements in the Earth's crust and one of the most common minerals as well. Uh, it, is, it forms in geothermal fluids and it's a part of the water rock interaction. It will, it is used as an indicator of subsurface temperatures and as stated, it naturally discharges, and these are just some nice images of how silica will form at the surface. Sorry, here. There we go. So, in silica, in geothermal production, silica is considered a nuisance. It will deposit in pipes, and as the water cools, that it will form around in the piping, as you can see in this middle picture here, and it can cause blockage and basically reduce your production. And of course, that is a problem when efficiency is of a high concern. So some things that geothermal sites do to avoid this is acid dosing, re-injecting um, at high temperature, the water, and this allows the silica to participate before re-injection. You can also use chemical inhibitors to break down the silica in the piping. Um, carbonate, very similar to silica in that it will deposit within the pipes and form blockage. Uh, and very similar, you can use chemical inhibitors to break it down um, or scheduled workovers, which were, as you can see, you will take off the pipe and Clean, clean it out. So some of the other factors and uh, outside factors in a geothermal system are environmental effects and social acceptance. Uh, as Fernando said, my research really deals with social acceptance of geothermal. Uh, I'm not gonna go in too much into that today, but everything that we're about, I'm about to discuss affects that. And when people are concerned about a geothermal development, it's usually because they've heard of one of these issues. So, of course, the physical impacts, which is the visual, you seeing the production go up, maybe this used to be in a natural um, national park or something like that. So you're turning in a landscape into something else. Of course, the noise of construction will affect the surrounding area, the reservoir changes due to production and just the environment around the site can change. And then seismicity subsidence, which we're about to discuss. The noise, just to give an idea of how loud geothermal development can be, an open geothermal well with a vertical discharge, it's about 120 decibels, the same as a rock concert. Uh, turbine, so normal plant operations include the generators, pumps, and fans, the cooling towers and condensers can be quite noisy. Of course, the turbines, um, are inside the power plant. So unless you're inside the plant, they're not necessarily a nuisance. Drilling and testing of wells is the loudest part of construction. So this is seismicity, which is essentially the causing of earthquakes due to the changes in fluid pressure. Um, so it causes fracturing or movement in the rocks. Um, the severity of the event depends on the state of stress in the rock and the mechanical behavior of the rock. And we, as the geothermal industry has progressed, there are ways to more efficiently measure this than in the past. 
Um, of course, however, this is still one of the main concerns that communities have when discussing the development of a geothermal resource is if the seismic effects of the region are going to suddenly become more intense. And um, a case of this is in Switzerland, where um, a power plant was abandoned due to the seismic uh, effects. Subsidence is when the ground actually will compact, compact in because you have removed so many so much liquid from the reservoir. So the cause is decline in shallow steam pressure or in the groundwater level. And the rock will literally compress on top of itself. Um, it can be in tens to hundreds of meters. In the worst areas, 450 millimeters a year. And the consequences of this is it can interfere with the system itself. Rivers flood, the steam fields can change in nature, causing broken wells, well casings, or deforming the piping network. Uh, the steam can flow through the, through the surface, to the surface through these new cracks. And in general, this type of environmental effect causes uh, large trouble for the geothermal plant. Um, ways to mitigate this are to maintain subsurface pressure through the reinjection of the well. So, at, once again, as geothermal technology has improved, we have a better understanding of the system. And through reinjection, you can negate uh, the effects of this, or at least to some extent. So, and then the emissions from a geothermal plant often they are carbon dioxide. There are some others that are more specific to what the chemical composition of the reservoir is, but almost all contain carbon dioxide and Matt is going to talk more about how we negate that in just a moment. Um, so the monitoring, of course, something that is so important to everything that we do. Um, these are the basic ways of monitoring the system. A lot of different um, things that we need to keep track of. So a little bit back to Iceland, you know, this is how the country has progressed over the years. Back in 1974, when the first power plant came online, 3.2 megawatts produced, a small with Krafla, and, and we build up over time until today we're at five gigawatts a year. A uh, really amazing project that was has been going on in Iceland is the uh, Iceland Deep Drilling Program. And so they're looking answers to the biggest question. So what is really happening deep, deep, deep in the earth? What are the temperature measurements? Um, is it possible to utilize this resource? Is it possible to produce energy with it? And at IDDP1, um, they actually reached temperatures just above, they reached the magma, just above the magma pocket and found temperatures to be at 900 Celsius, so quite hot. Um, a little model of how the IDDP well works. And then the second IDDP uh, well was drilled in 2017. It reached a depth of 4,600 meters and what found heats greater than 430 Celsius. Um, so a normal production well is only from 60 meters or 600 meters to 3,500 meters deep. So this is about 1,500 meters deeper. The heat is usually 240 to 320 and costs anywhere from five to 10 million. So you can imagine the cost of this drilling program. So what does the inside of a geothermal plant look like? Um, it's a complicated system of pipes, turbines, uh, heat exchangers, you know, but they can be quite beautiful. Um, in the bottom right here, we have the district heating. Uh, it was the first combined electricity and district heating plant in the world, and it still is operational today. Of course, one of the most famous geothermal plants in, or sites is the Blue Lagoon. It's a major tourist 
attraction millions of visitors a year. The, um, you can use the silica and purchase it, rub it on your face. It's great for your skin. And you know, it's a great example of how cascading geothermal use can really improve the economic value of a geothermal system. So district heating, um, it uses the geothermal water for heating instead of creating electricity. And in Iceland, it has saved hundreds of millions of tons of CO2 emissions. Um, mostly uses temperatures lower than 150 Celsius. Most of the district heating systems in Iceland have been operating for over 40 years. The first was in 1907, um, but the large scale distribution in the Reykjavik capital area began in 1930. And the cumulative oil savings by using geothermal are 22 billion USD or five times the Icelandic treasury, which is a pretty impressive statistic. Geothermal is a great way to offset fossil fuels and make money. So some of the, another form of cascaded use, and this is a really kind of new research and development that we've been having in Iceland, and that is the growing of algae. You can use the algae not only to capture carbon, but you can use it in fish food. There's also been some breakthroughs with using it in medicine, and it's effectively becoming a high priced commodity that is grown just from residual geothermal heat. So turning waste into income in a way. Another big industry in Iceland is fish drying. Obviously, Iceland not only catches a lot of fish for consumption, but they dry and export it. So approximately 15,000 tons of dried cod heads are sent to Nigeria every year. Another very popular form of direct heat use is greenhouses. Uh, geothermally heated greenhouses have been in use since 1924. And the artificial light also provides heat and the geothermal CO2 increases production and it's able to keep the inside of the greenhouse at a constant temperature throughout the year, which of course means you can grow tomatoes, cucumbers, um, and all types of vegetables all year long, which is very important in a climate where you might not have sunlight for six months out of the year. Here is the type of energy use within Iceland. Um, geothermal clearly makes up a large part of it. Of course, there's still some oil, some coal, but we are reaching closer to 100% renewables every year. Back, and so this space heating graph is interesting to see, and obviously oil was a big part of that. And through increased development of geothermal resources, we've been able to get that down to almost zero. And the final heat uses within Iceland, once again, most of it is for space heating, but then balinology, heating of swimming pools, snow melting in the streets, um, in the fisheries, and the aquaculture for keeping the water at a consistent temperature for the fish, industrial applications. Um, a big industry in Iceland is aluminum production. Uh, a lot of it is created using the high temperature and then shipped to Europe or the United States. And then, of course, the greenhouses, as previously discussed. The consumption levels. Um, so even though industry might be a smaller fraction of the heat use, it uses most of the energy produced. Um, to talk about the Blue Lagoon just a little bit more and how cascaded use works, it, it's very important to the geothermal industry to begin to become more efficient with the use of the heat and create circular economic systems. So with that, the, the way the Blue Lagoon works is you have a, the geothermal power plant and the residual water is put into the swimming pool where it is then a site for tourists to go enjoy themselves. But then even after that, the water is then used at, in the, either for growing algae or for making high quality skincare products. Um, a second example of cascaded use would be to 
use the heat in a flash plant, which then the residual can be used to create more electricity, electricity in a binary plant, which can then the residual hot water can be used to heat ponds for aquaculture and then so on. And so this is the geothermal pie, slice of the pie in the world. Um, renewables, unfortunately, only make up 13, almost 14% of our overall system. And within that, geothermal is only four, not even 4%. So we need to continue to work hard to make geothermal a more common and widespread renewable. Um, predictions state that the geothermal energy will only grow um, in, with installed capacity and a direct use going up. And therefore, that gives a lot of options for jobs. And uh, anyone who's interested in geothermal, I think will have plenty of opportunities to work in this industry and to grow and to learn and to be a real contribution to the, to the world. Um, just to talk about Dyson School of Energy, graduate courses are taught in English and we have students from all over the world who come and talk and they're now some of my bestest of friends. So just to discuss that and we have people that we work with in the geothermal industry and this is only a small slice and really only those in Iceland. So thank you for your time and I hope you've learned something. Thank you so much, Jackson. It was an interesting presentation all about uh, the geothermal setting of Iceland and all of the uses. It's really uh, amazing what they can do with geothermal. And now, uh, if anyone has a question, please let us know in the chat. Uh, here we have a question from Julian uh, Ortiz. So uh, in the deep high temperature, temperature wells that you are drilling, uh, 900, 100 uh, Celsius, would you use traditional or an enhanced, an enhanced geothermal system? I believe it's an enhanced geothermal system. Matt, is that? Yeah, I could chime in here. I think um, in the first IDDP-1 well, which was drilled in the Krafla field, um, I think they ended up drilling into 900 degrees, which was basically right above the magma and then had to shut the well in because they were at risk of a blowout. And so I think if they were to stay there, they would have tried to enhance the system. Um, but then the IDDP2 project that's drilled in the Reykjanes Peninsula um, at the Reykjanes power plant uh, there, I believe that the temperatures they were reaching um, also came with sufficient flow where they wouldn't need to enhance it. Um, but I think the idea is that once you can get to these depths through you know, um, deep drilling, then you can enhance the system regardless of where you are just because you have really high temperatures. Thank you. Thanks, Matt. Matt. <laughs> now, uh, if we don't have any more questions, um, we're going to introduce now to Matt Vilante. So Matt Vilante is a geothermal scientist pursuing his master's in sustainable energy science at Reykjavik University. Originally from Central Florida, Matt received his bachelor's in geology and Chinese from Washington and Lee University in Lexington, Virginia. Throughout his career as a geoscientist, Matt has traveled the globe learning about the impacts and solutions to climate change in Denmark, Belize, China, and New Zealand. Although Matt's research focuses on carbon capture and mineralization through the carfix process, he has previously co-authored research on geothermal from abandoned oil and gas wells and worked in the US DOE's Hydrogen and Fuel Cell Technologies Office. Now, welcome, Matt, and thank you for your presentation. Thank um, you. I believe there was a hand raised at the end. Hernan, did you have something you wanted to ask Jackson before I start? Oh, uh, Herman, yeah? Um, yes, Herman, do you, do you have a question? Let's see, unmute. Now you can unmute, pues, uh, uh, Hello, thank Hello. you, thank you. Good, 
because we, we recommend a uh, right. So thank you for the for the my voice. Okay. So use Iceland in a legal or in a government uh, legislation in in Iceland. What what is the uh, what is the way or how uh, how do is Iceland about this meaning or about this topic because it's 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 easy for for our countries uh, the technical or is 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 a viable but when you uh, try these pilots or this project you 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 find uh, a law and regulation about this 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 technology this new technology so how 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 do Iceland about this topic or what is the strategy in, in Iceland Oh, you're muted, uh, Jackson. It's a difficult question for an outsider to answer. You know, I'm from the U.S. as well, but from what I understand and what I've seen in Iceland, you know, they have grown up with geothermal for generations. Now, this is not something new to them. This is something they understand quite well. Um, if it's a question of funding that you're asking about, um, it's... There's large funds that come from the European, the EU and things like that. Like the IDDP was done in conjunction with other groups. Um, and from a regulatory standpoint, I think it is a national energy group that develops all of the utilities for the country. So unlike some other nations where there's a private sector and a public sector, this is this is a merged group that is investing for the will of the people and it, it's you know Iceland is famous for its geothermal resources so it, it's something that they take great pride in and in the research and development and the rollout of all this it's just part of the system I, I wish I had a better answer for you but I don't um, I, I can't Thank you, Jackson. Uh, okay, uh, thanks from Edna. And now, without uh, further ado, let's move on with uh, Matt's presentation about Carpex. Great, um, I'll get started then. So thank you all for, for joining today and, and being willing to learn about carp fix and the future of geologic CO2 storage via rapid mineralization. So I'm sure many of us are aware of the sort of drastic nature of climate change right now and the significant need to rapidly, rapidly reduce our emissions. Um, and so here is a chart from the IEA showing the different pathways um, to reduce emissions by 2060 to meet our climate goals. And as we can see, renewables and increasing the share of renewables in our energy mix is obviously the number one goal followed closely behind by improving efficiency. But then third and second, and definitely not a small portion of the pie is carbon capture and storage at 115 gigatons. And just to kind of give you an idea of what a gigaton is, because not many people would really be able to visualize what a gigaton of carbon dioxide is, this is the Goldfoss waterfall in Iceland. And if you could imagine being that guy in the blue jacket standing there, this amount of water would have to pump, be pumped into the ground as CO2 continuously until 2060 for us to pump down 115 gigatons. So to meet our climate goals, we really rapidly have to start scaling up um, CCS, whether it be in the carb fix method or other technologies. So to give you a little background uh, about carb fix and what their process actually is, um, it's for maybe some of the geoscientists here, since I'm a geologist, I'll try to keep it simple, but it's basically imitating the natural silicate weathering cycle that we know has um, regulated climate over long geologic timescales on Earth. And so there's basically two key ingredients to this, um, basalt and other reactive rock formations. These are typically mafic rocks, um, volcanic rocks that have um, a lot of calcium, magnesium, and iron. And then when you combine that with CO2 dissolved in water, or basically um, 
like a carbonic acid, then you can form solid stable carbonates as um, calcite, magnesite, um, siderite, and then some other um, secondary carbonate minerals. And so by taking this natural um, analog and accelerating it through technology, Carbfix has actually been able to capture CO2 and turn it into new stone underground within two years. And so a, li a little bit about the timeline of Carbfix and how they became. Um, it really started as an academic research project uh, through the University of Iceland, CNRS Toulouse, and Columbia University in 2007. And so as they were preparing this, they had countless PhD students that worked on um, the verification, the modeling, uh, the geochemical analysis. And then finally, within by 2011, they were able to start a pilot injection at the Hetlis Haiti geothermal power plant just outside of Reykjavik. Um, over the next two years, they continuously monitored and injected around uh, 2,000 tons of CO2. And by 2014, they were able to confirm that mineral storage was occurring. And within two years, they were seeing uh, mineralization in, a, in excess of 80% of the injected CO2. So clearly this showed Carbfix and the researchers that this was a viable solution to storing CO2 safely um, in a short amount of time and permanently. And so over the last five or six years, um, industrial scale operations have continued at the uh, Hetlis Haiti geothermal power plant. Um, and more recently, some, some really exciting work has been going on. Um, so the Carbfix filed their, their first patents just after 2018. And in 2019, uh, Carbfix was established as a company, uh, part of a subsidiary of Orkuveta Reykjaviker, which is basically Reykjavik Energy, which is a large um, sort of vertically integrated uh, energy company within the capital region focused on the power, uh, the distribution, and then now some of the innovation, which is with Carbfix. Um, and recently, I'm sure um, some of you have heard about this in the news, but uh, Carbfix is partnered with another company, a Swiss company called Climeworks, and they're working on uh, di directly capturing CO2 from the air. And now they're injecting that CO2 captured from the air into the ground at the same site to permanently take that CO2 out of the air and turn it into rock. So now as we move, as Carbfix moves forward into the future, um, they're rapidly scaling up, uh, partnering with different industries and commercial interests to use their expertise um, and experience in mineralizing uh, carbon in Iceland to not only uh, build the industry in Iceland, but also look into uh, expanding the industry <clears throat> outside of Iceland. So a little bit about what is unique about mineral storage. So in conventional or traditional CO2 storage or CCS, um, pure CO2 is typically injected through wells into a very, very deep uh, reservoir or aquifer. Um, and this is done in a super critical state, uh, very high pressures so that that CO2 won't want to uh, buoyantly travel back up to the surface through any maybe faults or fractures. And so you won't get leakage of CO2 that way. However, what makes Carbfix such a great idea and such a great um, technology is that by mixing the CO2 with water, um, and when you put it into the well, that CO2 is automatically more dense than the surrounding aquifer water and will preferentially sink into the formation. And so you immediately reduce or eliminate the risk of leakage of CO2, um, which is often one of the primary concerns with any um, CCS project. Moreover, it's been proven to be cheaper than many of the alternative solutions um, with lower upfront capital costs and risk. Um, I think the estimate right now is that Carbfix can store a ton of CO2 for about 50 US dollars, which is pretty cheap. And additionally, because these wells don't need to be drilled to a super uh, high depth, uh, you can see on the image on the left, the Carbfix wells are much shallower between 500 and 1000 meters. Um, and they can also reuse uh, wells that are, you know, injection wells or monitoring wells at geothermal sites. Um, moreover, it's environmentally friendly because it's imitating a natural, um, a natural analog for storing CO2 in rocks. Um, and as I mentioned, you reduce the, um, the impact of any leakage. It's permanent, so these minerals are stable for thousands of years, which limits the need for any long-term monitoring. So after that two to three year period, you can be certain that that CO2 is turned into stone. Um, finally, it's built on very, very solid scientific, um, scientific research 
many of the papers over the last 10 years are public and live on the CarbFix website. So if you're interested in it, please read. Um, but it's, it's really, really robust. They've done tons of monitoring and validation that they probably didn't need to. Um, but since they're trying to prove that this is an effective and safe method, um, that was the best way to go forward. Finally, it's, it's highly flexible um, and modular. Um, as you can see on the left, you can have multiple wells in one field and have them all injecting the same reservoir. Um, and additionally, you can then apply that to geothermal plants around the world or theoretically any well around the world that's being drilled into basalt or through basalt. Um, finally, they've seen a high level of public acceptance with the project. So most Icelanders at least know about carb fix. They accept carb fix. Um, and they believe that what they're doing uh, at the geothermal plant is great for the country and also for the world as we tackle some of these significant climate challenges. So on the left here, you can see uh, a little bit of a diagram of the storage mechanisms. And so on the left, uh, diagram A is the conventional injection. And so the primary trapping mechanism in conventional CO2 storage is structural or stratigraphic trapping, which means that you have an injection layer, the reservoir where you're injecting with a cap rock above it and a cap rock below it. And so there you're relying mostly on the structural integrity of the rock and also your characterization of that reservoir so that you know there's no faults or fractures that are gonna allow CO2 to migrate. Um, and over time, as that CO2 is trapped in that reservoir, you will have residual CO2 trapping in the pore space of the rock, as well as solubility trapping as that CO2 dissolves in water. However, over geologic timescales, mineralization of CO2 uh, takes quite a long time, especially in non-mafic reservoirs. However, in image B on the right, you can see that carb fixes injection of dissolved CO2 in water immediately, immediately creates solubility trapping by dissolving that CO2 in water, creating a denser fluid that can then no longer migrate. And then that mineral trapping occurs over timescales of months to years rather than tens to hundreds, thousands of years. So a little bit of an idea um, about where this is possible. Um, so fun fact, um, basalt is actually the most common rock on the earth, um, takes up about 70% of the surface. And although most of this is offshore and the mid-ocean ridges, um, a lot of this, as you can see from the map, um, is on land and conveniently, it also um, overlaps with many of the regions that have geothermal power plants. Uh, like Jackson was mentioning, the Ring of Fire along the west coast of the United States. Um, Iceland is fully basalt pretty much. Um, and then also along the, the Pacific Rim and then throughout um, other regions, the West Africa Rift Zone and, and other parts of, of Europe. And basalt is unique because it is very um, scattered throughout the world. And so oftentimes um, in locations such as sedimentary basins, you won't find basalt. Um, however, if you're not in a sedimentary basin, you might find basalt. And so CarbFix's technology and approach unlocks large, large areas where CCS may not have been considered possible in the past. And this map is from the CarbFix Atlas, which is a tool that they have developed um, to basically map out the potential sites for CarbFix and also provide a open source public um, platform for people to um, view where this could, could be feasible. So pertaining to Iceland, uh, the storage capacity of Iceland is about 2,500 2, gigatons. And so if you remember back to that second slide I showed, the necessary um, CCS contribution to our, our um, emissions reductions is only 110 gigatons. So the application of carb fix in Iceland is a great place to start because you have an, you have an island that is almost entirely volcanic basalt. You have really, really young formations that can be within 10,000 or, or 5,000 years old. Um, and so many of these are still highly permeable, chemically favorable. They haven't been altered by heat or time yet. And so these are the ideal candidates for carb fix to um, attempt carbon mineralization at. Um, and so just some, some sites to point out on the map, the red zones are the youngest basaltic formations in Iceland. Uh, blue, the blue stars are the existing harbors. Um, the reason that the harbors are significant, I'll get to shortly, um, but CarbFix is planning to uh, create a CCS uh, shipping chain and supply chain so that um, industrial sources in Europe, for example, or North America 
could transport their CO2 to Iceland and have it stored in a safe and effective manner. Um, the green star is the Hetlis Haiti geothermal plant and the carb fix uh, demonstration site that I discussed initially. Um, that's also where the direct air capture units are placed currently. And then finally, the gold star is the CODA terminal that I'm going to discuss um, a little bit later. And that's one of their um, up and coming projects that will um, scale up uh, the carb fix technology. So a little bit about monitoring verification. So how do we know that this is actually happening? Um, it's one of the most important aspects of really any CCS project because ultimately, if you are putting CCS in the or if you are putting carbon in the ground, but you don't know whether it's staying there or if it's coming back up to the surface somehow, then you're realistically not making any difference. And so monitoring and verifying this is super important. And in the CarbFix demonstration site, a lot of the work was done on this exact topic. Um, and they showed that through measurements of um, dissolved inorganic carbon and carbon-14 isotopes through uh, non-reactive tracer tests, the, uh, the target storage formation can mineralize between 95 and 98% of the injected CO2 within roughly a year or a year and a half. Um, and furthermore, this, um, this drill uh, drill casing here on the, on the left, part of the drill string, uh, this is actually a submersible pump that they used as part of their tracer test. Um, and as you can see, it has uh, a lot of uh, what I believe was anchorite on it. And so this is a calcium carbonate mineral that uh, actually precipitated directly onto the metal. And so they did, they have had uh, drill cores and samples like this that have shown that um, what they're doing is actually mineralizing um, into new, new minerals. And just the, the schematic cross section here, this kind of shows um, an ideal, the ideal system. So they inject the gas charged water down through one borehole. Um, and then as that um, water charged or CO2 charged water migrates throughout the formation, uh, carbonate and sulfide minerals dissolve. And then they use the um, production wells as a method of verifying uh, through a tracer test. So here are just some images of the Hetlis Haiti geothermal plant where CarbFix is mostly operating now. And so the upper right image is the geothermal plant, uh, quite beautiful, probably one of the nicest power plants you'll ever be to. Um, and then on the left, top left, you can see some of the carb fix injection wells and the pipes that uh, carry the CO2 charged water. On the bottom left is the scrubbing tower that takes the, the gases from the geothermal plant, from the cooling towers, scrubs out the CO2 and H2S, and then injects and then transfers it through these pipes to the injection wells where it then goes in the ground. And then finally on the bottom right is the wonderful CarbFix team. So talking, moving into some of the more exciting developments for CarbFix, um, Project Silverstone uh, is actually a recent project that was uh, given funding through the EU Innovation Fund. Um, so as Jackson mentioned, Iceland has really um, pushed to uh, not only develop their, their renewable energy like geothermal and hydrogen or hydropower, but also uh, push these innovative ideas and push people to think about, although we have the technical expertise and we know, um, you know, we know the hard skills, how can we think outside of the box to, you know, bring in new industries to Iceland, bring in funding, and how can we make impacts that will not only affect Iceland, but also the world. So Project Silverstone is aiming to uh, take the capture at the geothermal power plant to full scale. So currently um, around seven, a little bit above 70,000 tons of CO2 have been injected since 2014. Um, however, that's only about 30, 25 to 30% of the uh, power plant's emissions. And so by 2025, they've planned to scale that up to about 95%. Um, and so their new plan involves building a more uh, optimized capture plant that will take uh, much more of the CO2 from the power plant and this orange stream uh, into the scrubbing tower and then down to the injection wells. And as I mentioned earlier, this is expected to run the entire CCS chain at about 27 euros per ton, uh, which is one of the lowest costs for CCS in the world. Um, and these are some of the industrial applications of CarbFix and the cost. And so 
Traditional CCS with amine capture basically involves um, solvents that will capture the CO2 out of a, a gas stream. However, you can see here that water capture is actually much cheaper if you have CO2 concentrations that are higher, like in industries like the coal power industry or cement and steel making, geothermal or biofuels, for example. And so geothermal is one great way that we can um, reduce our emissions through the carb fix technology because it's cheap, it's safe, and many of the, many of the um, required infrastructure is already there on site, like production and injection wells. And so it can, it can vastly reduce the costs compared to um, a new project. So the single step CCS on the left, uh, this is basically what is um, occurring currently at the Petla Sadi power plant where the emissions from the geothermal plant are mixed with uh, water and a scrubbing tower. The CO2 free emissions are released to the atmosphere and then the water dissolved CO2 is injected into the ground. Um, however, there's also two-step CCS, uh, whereby a third party captures that CO2 um, from whatever method they're using, transports it to an injection well that CarbFix is running, where it's then mixed and injected downhole. So as I mentioned earlier, um, in the last three years, CarbFix has partnered with Climeworks uh, to start the first commercial direct air capture and storage chain. Um, and so far, the capacity of this project is about 4,000 tons of CO2 per year. That CO2 is injected to about 400 to 2,000 meters depth, um, depending on the injection well that is used. And this, again, has been verified using chemical tracers and monitoring methods that CarbFix has project, um, perfected over the last 10 years. So these, these giant fans are basically exactly what they look like. Um, they suck CO2 directly out of the air, uh, where it's then piped through these pipelines and to the injection well that we saw in one of the earlier images uh, where it can be sent into the ground and permanently stored. So the CODA terminal. So this is uh, one of the, the sites I mentioned in the, the larger Iceland map, um, but, but it is basically a project that um, CarbFix is working on with EU funding to scale up uh, the CCS supply chain in Europe. And so, um, they're basically looking at multiple sites in the UK, Ireland, um, and other parts of mainland Europe to ship CO2 uh, via um, large-scale shipping containers uh, to Iceland to be stored on site. And the reason that this is actually scalable and cost-effective is that CarbFix has shown their technology to be a very low-cost storage option, meaning that although transporting it from you know, the UK or Denmark to Iceland may not make sense. It still is economically feasible because of the low cost storage once it gets to Iceland. Um, additionally, there's low energy requirements and clean energy is abundant in Iceland, making it a great site for it. And so the Coda terminal will basically be one large industrial carb fix injection site with multi-well operations that will lower the risk um, and ultimately store CO2 for industrial customers um, or governments or anyone else who will have uh, CO2 that needs to be stored um, that would also like it to be um, deductible under the emissions trading scheme that's um, adopted in Europe currently. And so you can see their, their plans for scale up. Uh, a lot of the work that's going on at CarbFix right now is for um, preparation and modeling the site. And so here's the proposed site of the Coda terminal. Um, you can see two red dots where proposed wells might be. The large red outline is kind of the overall um, site. And conveniently, it's located just right next to one of those large aluminum, smel aluminum smelters that Jackson mentioned in his presentation. And so they're also partnering with Rio Tinto, which is a large multinational aluminum corporation uh, to inject their CO2 produced on site, transfer it across the road and pump it into the ground. And finally, the, um, the shipping partner for this is Dan Unity CO2, who is uh, currently commissioning and operating spe special CO2 carrier ships. Um, so moving into some of the future work for CarbFix. So although it started at, as, a, as a, you know, an academic project and a project that was specific to geothermal plants, 
Um, the goal for CarbFix now is to expand the reach of their technology outside of just geothermal um, and into different industries like steel or cement or aluminum smelting or really anywhere that CO2 can be captured by water. Um, however, one of the issues uh, that they've found through their research in the past is that it is a uh, quite a water intensive process. So for every ton of CO2 that's injected underground, you need about 25 tons of water. And so in many locations, this is a really serious problem. Iceland is fine, they have abundant fresh water. But if you, for example, wanted to try and uh, mineralize CO2 from a geothermal power plant in Africa, that might not be even possible unless you can use, for example, seawater. And so a lot of the work that's going on now is also looking at um, conducting a field scale uh, pilot injection of seawater dissolved CO2, and that will take place this year. Um, just near um, Reykjavik on the Reykjanes Peninsula. Um, and this CO2 will be captured and transported from Switzerland uh, as part of a um, partnership with one of the universities there to study the feasibility of actually transporting CO2 from mainland Europe and setting up a full-scale CCS supply chain. Um, and so on the right is just a picture of Martin, um, one of the workers at, at CarbFix, and the work he has done uh, to verify the uh, feasibility of seawater as a, um, a water source for carb fix. So finally, um, I will talk a little bit about my thesis work. Um, so one of their new projects that they've received funding from uh, both the Icelandic Innovation Fund and the Sorpa Waste Management um, Company in Reykjavik is called the uh, Elfstone Project. And basically what is going on is that they're capturing CO2 from a landfill near the capital. Um, this CO2 forms uh, from organic waste uh, just as a byproduct of decomposition along with methane. Uh, Sorpa uh, captures the methane, which they then sell off to market. Um, obviously methane is a very valuable commodity and can be used in a lot of uh, fuel applications. However, Sorpa also needs to reduce their um, emissions and hence the partnership with CarbFix now. And so beginning uh, in the fall of last year, uh, Sorpa has been scrubbing the CO2 out of their um, out of their methane separation unit and injecting it underground at a nearby well. So the pilot phase is aiming to store uh, 3,500 tons of CO2 in 2022, and then uh, they have plans to ramp that up to 7,500 tons in the future. And overall, this project is aiming to reduce the carbon footprint of waste management, um, explore the feasibility of mineralizing carbon in older, more altered basalts and then verify the storage for generation of carbon credits. And so my thesis work is focusing on modeling the low temperature geotherm geothermal system at the site. Um, because it's a landfill and not a geothermal plant, um, most of the research there has been focused on the landfill operations and there's very little um, uh, literature available on the system there. And so I've been working to create a conceptual geologic model, which is up in the top right. Um, and then as well as a temperature model that can be used for um, reservoir modeling. And so we are, um, we are going to be conducting an injection experiment at the end of May that will basically uh, be used to verify the storage at the site and um, gather hydrogeologic parameters so that our reservoir models can be compared to the test results um, and then ultimately be used to uh, verify that carbon is actually being stored at the site so that um, the SORPA waste management company can generate carbon credits to be sold off to the market and reduce their emissions. And thank you. I think that is it for me, but I'll be happy to take any questions. Uh, thank you so much for your presentation, Matt. Uh, it was really interesting. And we have two questions so far. Uh, first one from Carol Barrera. Uh, is the induced seismicity lower with the car fix injection compared to the conventional injection? Also, what is the difference in the amount of water used? Yeah, Carol, that's a great question. Um, so actually in, in the start of the carb fix project um, in about 2014, they, they had some issues with induced seismicity at the power plant. Um, and that wasn't necessarily just from the carb fix injection, but it was from the reinjection of geothermal fluids there. Um, but now the geothermal plant there has taken up a sort of sustainable injection strategy that covers both the geothermal power plant reinjections 
and the carb fix injections. And so um, since 2014, I think they've had only maybe one minor like magnitude one or two earthquake. Whereas before 2014, uh, I think they had um, a couple hundred. And so compared to the conventional injection, um, it would definitely depend on the local stress regime and um, kind of how much you're injecting and is that injection amount sustainable? Is it gonna, you know, exceed the, the, um, the sort of pressure threshold that's, you know, governed by the lithology there? Um, or is it gonna be under that? And so really it is kind of a site specific thing to, um, to say whether the seismicity is lower. Um, but I think because of carb fixes and experience uh, with induced seismicity and the, the public pushback on that, now it's kind of a core part of their operations moving forward is to make sure that the amount that they're injecting is sustainable and safe and not going to cause any issues that could, you know, really either halt a project or completely um, cancel it. And I think you had a question, the, the amount of the difference in the amount of water used. In conventional, uh, in conventional CCS, you're not really using any water except for the surface operations. So you're, you're, you're basically taking CO2 into its purest form and um, compressing it into a supercritical state and then injecting it down just as pure CO2. And so for carb fix, uh, they're using quite a bit of water. Um, and like I mentioned before, that's about 25 tons per ton of CO2. Thank you, Matt. Um, yeah. Now we have another question from Julian Ortiz. Um, how do you calcu calculate the total capacity that can be stored in the well and at the same time, uh, the useful life of the well to store CO2? Yeah, that, that's a great, a great question. Um, so most of the, the work that's been done to calculate the total capacity um, has been through those tracer tests that I was mentioning. and, and the validation and monitoring aspects of it. And so what you basically do is you take a tracer, um, a non-reactive chemical that you pump into the injection well, it then travels through that reservoir and then up back into another production well. And you can basically take the difference in the, um, the mass balance from when you inject it into the ground to the time it comes out to determine how much is actually being um, precipitated out. And a lot of this involves like geochemical programs like Frixi, um, and then um, using basic assumptions on the rock properties, so like the porosity. Um, and then you can basically come up with a number that's going to say how much is being um, stored in a certain volume of that reservoir, and what you know about that reservoir then can inform you about uh, the capacity of that well. Um, and I think the for the useful life of the well, that that definitely depends on how, so for example, if you drill the new well, then that useful life is going to be a lot longer than if you're reusing a well that maybe was an injection well for 45 years. And so the integrity of a well that's been used, for example, at the geothermal power plant um, is going to be a lot lower than a new well that they're drilling. However, um, the CO2 dissolved in water uh, is pretty, um, you know, safe for the well, so it doesn't cause any like excess corrosion. Um, and so it, it really shouldn't be an issue beyond just kind of general well integrity and um, maintenance and what would be applicable to a normal geothermal plant. Okay, thank you. I think that partly answers the next question uh, from Daniela, hmm. which is how many injection wells do you need if you plan to inject CO2 shipped from other countries? And is there a limitation of tons of CO2 to be injected in each well? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so the CODA terminal, which is kind of Carbfix's plan to bring in CO2 from other countries and store it, they're planning to drill about 10 wells and then expand from there in a, in a modular step-up um, program. And so, <clears throat> Theoretically, um, for carb fix at least, they would need as many injection wells as they have CO2 coming to them. So they're, they're more kind of like a, um, I guess right now the market is flush with CO2 that needs to be stored somewhere. Um, and so carb fix is really scrambling to try and 
uh, get these operations set up so that they can sort of um, take that market signal and, and turn it into to profits. Um, and, and as far as the limitation on each well, um, it's it's mostly just governed by the like um, the CO2 concentration in that dissolved water. And that's um, controlled by like where the source of that CO2. So one of the images I showed, I think um, showed that like for geothermal, the CO2 composition is about 50%, but for cement industries, it's about 10%. And so depending on how much is actually coming to the site, um, that's gonna determine how much is actually being stored in the ground. However, the well, the capacity of the well is just a volumetric thing. How much water can you actually put down into the ground? Thank you. Now, the next question is from Pierre Durst. Uh, is the mineralization quick enough to allow pumping water in the reservoir? So um, I think if, if I'm understanding right, um, Pierre, you can jump in, but are you asking, does the mineralization affect the injection over time? Like, does it reduce the amount of injection you can do? I think it's, uh, uh, maybe that's related to the next question from Christo. Um, hmm. But let's hear it from uh, Peter. If, uh, oh. Ah, so is yes. Is it possible yeah. to pump water? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and so, um, it is still possible to pump water out of the reservoir um, in this. So at the geothermal power plant, they're injecting into a reservoir that isn't used for production. Um, and so they have monitoring wells there that they've drilled for the carb fix project. Um, but the, the actual wells that are used to pump water um, for the power plant are in sort of a different, um, a different reservoir. However, with with the injection, it doesn't necessarily, um, it doesn't impact the, I guess, ability to pump water out of that reservoir if you chose to, um, because that's how they are able to monitor and verify that uh, mineralization is occurring, is that they pump water uh, out of the reservoir. And because that water has a different chemical signature, then you can tell that um, some reactions were occurring and how much of that was actually turning into um, new minerals. So I think that may be kind of along the lines of uh, Christoph's question. Um, so yeah, a, a lot of, I think a lot of people would think that by, by mineralizing um, in the pore space of a rock, you would decrease the injectivity. Um, but actually they've, they found that because you're injecting um, CO2 charged water or carbonic acid, it has a really low pH, which promotes dissolution of the basalt rock. That dissolution actually creates more pore space. And so um, what they found is that the area, the injectivity around the well is actually enhanced slightly. And so the clogging, the clogging issue um, hasn't proven to be a problem uh, thus far. And they've, they've been able to actually prove that it's, it's increasing the injectivity directly around the well. Very interesting. Um, so uh, those are the questions for Matt. Uh, is there any more questions? <laughs> you see, it's an interesting topic to discuss. Um, so from Christoph, are you still capturing and storing CO2 from the nearby geothermal or only through the DAC system? Yeah, so they are, they are um, they're doing both at the same time. So they basically, the, the DAC system was kind of an add-on to the geothermal plant. And so it's run by the geothermal electricity. Um, it powers the, the fans and the turbines and then, or, or just the fans. And then that CO2 is transported to one of the carb fix injection wells that's uh, at the site of the geothermal plant. Um, and actually now, um, if you're interested in this, um, they actually just, they just started a pilot injection at one of the other geothermal power plants uh, near Reykjavik. So it's called Nessia Vetler, which is like really hard to see, to read, but. Yeah, I put it in the chat. This, this power plant is also starting a carb fix injection. Um, it's in kind of the same geothermal system. 
uh, but it's it's pretty interesting that they're expanding into new new geothermal plants. Thank you so much, Matt. Uh, I think there are no more questions. So, uh, so Matt, if you could share uh, the slides, if it's not confidential to mm -hmm. Tarpex, uh, Daniel is asking. So, I don't know. What would be the best way to do that? Send you an email? Uh, is there a group or? Yeah, yeah, I think uh, if, if if you can share them without any problem, uh, we mm -hmm. can publish them in the Geotor Room site. Sounds good. If, if that's not an issue. Okay, thank you. Now, uh, we, want to, we want to thank you, Matt and Jackson, for your time and your presentations that are very informative, very interesting about the geothermal energy in Iceland and all of it, uh, relate, all of the topics related to it uh, and the uses. And we want to thank the participants for being here today. Um, that was it for uh, the geothermal energy in Iceland and the, uh, the, the month of Iceland. Okay, so. Uh, thank you so much and see you in the next month, which is Algeria. Thank you all. Thank you. Goodbye. Have a nice day. You too.